This episode contains adult language and topics that may be disturbing for some listeners. Such topics include suicide, drug use, physical, or sexual abuse of a child. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Grant. And I'm Erica. And this is From From Crime Crime to to Crime. Crime. Welcome back to From Crime to Crime. Hey, buddy. Happy Father's Day. Almost. Well, yeah, we're almost there. Thank you. I'm very excited. My son is off with family, so I have a Father's Day solo, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> great. What a great Father's Day. But we're doing this episode because this is truly about a father's love for his son. So yeah. I think it's very fitting. Yeah, I think so, too. It worked out perfectly on the timing for Father's Day. I know. It really did. It really, really did. This week, we're going to be talking about Gary Plache. Gary lived in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Is this our first Louisiana case? I think it is. Ooh, is it? Where was Summer Wells from? Tennessee. Okay. So yeah, I think it might be. Yeah, I think it is. So we're talking about early 80s, 83, Islands in the Stream. Dolly Parton came (laughs) out that year. Just saying. Yeah. I don't know why I hadn't even thought about that, but obviously we got to know what's top in the country charts in 1983. Yep. Well, it sets the the mood. And I feel like in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that's what they're listening to. They're not listening to like speed metal. Um, (laughs) I don't know. I I feel like Louisiana goes a lot of different directions and I feel like Islands in the Stream could be one of them. I feel like speed metal could definitely be one of them. (laughs) (laughs) And then I feel like, you know. A French jazz quartet or something could be one of them, too. So Yeah, jazz for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So Gary and his wife, June, they, like I said, live in Baton Rouge, and they have four kids, three boys and a girl. Their son, Jody, is kind of like the middle kid. He's got an older brother and a younger brother and then a younger sister. So he's the second from the oldest. Right. Okay. And in 1983, Jody is in the fifth grade. And he is athletic as shit. He plays baseball, (laughs) basketball, soccer, football, everything. He plays all the sports. And his dad, Gary, is super involved, like coaches all of his teams. He's pretty close with his kids. That's the way to do it. I mean, that's the fun part of being a dad is being able to do their sports and stuff with them. Mine stopped playing, so I don't have this, but it was very fun when we were doing them. (laughs) I was just going to say you had more fun than Cy, though. I had such a good time. He's like, I'd rather be in band than you're like... (laughs) Great. I don't know how to play band, but yeah. yeah. You know what's funny about him choosing band was he had a choice between the saxophone and flute. And I was like, dude, the saxophone is so cool. And he was like, I'm going to choose the flute. And yeah. I was like, that's he did not it very just cool, to piss man. You off. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, is it pissed him off because he was he hated it. So <laughs> he should have gone with the sax. Uh, that's funny. I'm like, you should just play baseball because we know that. I don't know shit about the flute. Yeah. I know. We had to hire somebody else to do it. If you wanted to play baseball, basketball, football, even probably soccer, I could figure it out. But yeah, I don't know anything about the flute. Although I do play the didgeridoo, so they're they're similar. Yes. That's you don't, though. I do, too. Okay. So like we said, Gary's real involved with his kids sports. But when Jody's in class in the fifth grade, he gets a flyer from the school for like some kind of deal for karate classes. And that's not a real sport. So Jody just crumples it up and throws it away. (laughs) What? I mean, when you think of sports, I, I, you're right. Karate isn't one that comes up, but no. karate and all the other kinds of you know martial arts, they're super athletic. But you're right, like yeah. no one's sitting there going like, "Man, karate's my favorite sport." Like, yeah, no. So Jody crumples it up and throws it away because he's like, "No, nah, I play real sports. We're not doing this." <laughs> and he never thinks about it again until he gets home. His little brother got the same flyer and. Instead of crumpling it up and throwing it away, he brought it home and showed their mom. Because his little brother wasn't in any sport, he had no extracurriculars, the mom was like, well, you all get to do it, because that's how it worked back then. Like, if one kid did something, they all did it. Karate's expensive, too, so, like, these people must have some bucks. Yeah, well, this was, like, some kind of deal where it was, like, a certain amount of lessons for a certain price. So they signed him, Jody, his little brother, and his big brother up for this and a family friend and they go to a couple karate classes after like two or three the instructor quit showing up because even the instructor was like this is stupid i don't like this this doesn't pay enough (laughs) i shouldn't have ran that deal (laughs) yeah 
so then the karate studio hands over like all the kids that signed up for this deal over to a new instructor who was 24 years old and his name was Jeff Doucette. Now, Jeff was from Texas and he had no family in Louisiana and he didn't come from a great home, according to him, but he lived and breathed karate because he didn't know anybody else or do anything else. So he literally lived at the karate studio. Well, yeah, because he had no money to go along with it. It wasn't right. because he was just like, this is my passion. I mean, it probably was, but he lived there because he could afford it because I, I don't think yeah. they were charging him anything or if they were, they were it was very minimal. Right. And he had taken over these classes that were already paid for to a different instructor, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, eventually they'll have to start paying for them after the deal runs up. But he, he took over, but he's living in the karate studio. <laughs> Do you think maybe he just walked up and they were like, hey, we need an instructor. He's like, I need a place to stay. Can yeah. I stay here? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. He's like, Do you fit in this uniform? Those are called geese. But yeah. Do you fit in this gi? Yeah. Cool. Here's a black belt. <laughs> what? They're called skis? No, geese. G U I. Geese. I think it's like G-U-I. a gooey? <laughs> Except it's called a gi. <laughs> How do you know this? Oh, dude, you know I was in karate. No, you weren't. Yeah, until like fifth grade. Oh, yeah. I'm How, all, are, we, uh... how are we friends? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're lucky to be my friend because I can protect you because I, I think I'm a purple belt. I think that's what I got to. <laughs> you don't like that? No, no I love it. I love it. Oh, it's I just GI, that. by the way. Gi is just GI, but oh, but yeah, okay. no, I was a I was a purple belt. That makes sense for you. That totally fits you. Yeah, that's how I got so like strong and you know stuff. No, I meant the purple belt. Like I could just oh. see you in a purple belt. I don't know what you're laughing at. I take you down. Okay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take you down. So- you don't even know. Okay. Sweep the leg. Okay. But what you forget about sweeping the leg, like, I'm pretty low to the ground, bro. Like, I am i don't fall hard. Like, I don't have very far to go. That's okay. That's not what it's about. It's just that's how you do it. You sweep the leg, and then you wax on and wax off. I, I'm sure there was more to it than that, but I don't remember it. Yeah. All right. Let's get back to this, because <laughs> that was a fun tangent, but. You don't want to no. fight me. That's what I'm hearing from you. Oh, okay. You, you don't want none of this. Yeah. <laughs> it's real tough with your purple belt. <laughs> so... <laughs> Once I find it, I'm going to put it on and I'm going to beat you up. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, I am. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so hopefully Jeff has higher than a purple belt, but <laughs> Gary, Jody's dad, decides to let him like shower at their house and had him over for family dinners and stuff. Like he was really nice to him because Jeff was good with the kids and, you know, he spent a lot of time with them and he was really encouraging telling them how good they were at karate stuff like that like and Gary was like this kid's pitiful he doesn't have any family he lives at the karate studio so he started spending a lot of time at the Plache's house yeah it just goes to show like how good of a heart he had to take him in like that because yeah he brought him into his house and like totally welcomed him like as a family member Mm -hmm. literally gave him clothes to wear to family dinner and stuff and would take him to family dinners at their grandparents' house with them. He really was part of the family. Like, he was just an- another kid. Yeah. Jeff was, like, the cool guy, though, with the kids because he was younger than their parents but older than them, and he would let them do things that their parents didn't let him do. Like, he would let them drive while he was, like, driving. He would let them sit in his lap and drive the car, and he would just do the brake and the gas and everything, but they could steer. It's a very 1983 thing to do. Yeah. So Jeff started grooming Jody, though, pretty quickly because what the Plachés didn't realize when they let him into their family was that Jeff was a pedophile. So they started going to fight tournaments out of town, like in Houston and different places, mostly in Texas. While he was at these tournaments, he would molest Jody. That's nuts. Yeah, while there was other kids around. And there's a lot of rumors and a lot of speculation that he molested other kids that were in the karate class too, but not as extreme as he did with Jody. Right. So it was at one of these tournaments in Houston, like I said, that he molested him for the first time. And Jody didn't say anything, obviously. And so it continued and it got worse. By a few months into him molesting Jody, he started raping him. And he raped him daily, sometimes twice a day. Oh, man. So in the meantime, Jody's actually real good at karate. Like, Jeff wasn't lying about that. He's winning tournaments. He's really good. He's super athletic. And they're liking karate. So they spend more and more time 
with Jeff and more and more time at the karate studio. And Jody starts withdrawing from his other sports because he's so good at karate. So they think at the time, but it turns out Jeff's making him not play the other sports. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought it, I thought he willingly wanted to do more karate. So, wow. The, the level of, again, manipulation that we see in these kinds of cases is yeah. just sky high. Yeah. So eventually karate is Jody's only sport that he's playing. Around this same time, June and Gary start having some marital problems, too. They decide to separate. So Gary moves out of the family home. Yeah. That's a really hard. So Jeff's over a lot and Gary's no longer home. Right. So Jeff kind of swooped in and started helping. <laughs> helping. Yeah. He seized a very disgusting opportunity. Yes, he did. But he starts helping Gary and June in ways that he knows would be helpful to them, like picking the kids up from school and karate. And like I said, he was already spending massive amounts of time with them. And now he's spending way more time with them. Yeah. So it wasn't out of the ordinary or anything unusual. Sunday, February 19th, 1984, when Jeff asked June, which is Jody's mom, to borrow her car for an errand. And he was going to take Jody with him. And she was like, yeah, that's fine. Just don't be gone all day. Like, we got shit to do. It's Sunday. You know, whatever. Bring the car and my kid back. Soon. Do we know what Aaron it was, just for time reference? Yeah, he made something up about his brother owned some carpet company in Texas, and they were buying carpet for some job. I don't know. He was supposed to be checking on carpet at some job, but... None of that really makes sense. No, it doesn't. And I thought he didn't have any family he was in touch with, or he just didn't have any family in Louisiana. He didn't have any family in Louisiana. His family was all in Texas. Gotcha. Okay. So point of the story is that they don't come back. Not only did they not come back soon, they don't come back at all. So June is pretty worried. Her car and her kid are gone. And Jeff. Who she totally cares about now. Yeah. So that night, Jeff took Jody to his mom's house in Texas. His mom actually later that night called Jody's mom, June, and let her know that Jeff and Jody were at her house in Texas. So June was kind of a little bit relieved, like, oh, thank God they're okay. But what the fuck are they doing in Texas? Yeah, really? Well, they knew they were going to Texas, but why are they still there? They kind of like talked her into there was some kind of emergency and that Jody would be home tomorrow. Jeff would bring Jody back and the car back tomorrow. Super sorry it happened. But what was actually happening was Jeff was running from a law, some kind of lawsuit that he allegedly embezzled thousands of dollars from people selling fake coffee cups or something. <laughs> okay. What a weird thing to be involved in. Fake coffee cups? From what I read, it was something about LSU. Oh, okay. It wasn't like licensed or something. It was, But then he sold all these coffee cups, but then never did the coffee. I don't know. I don't I even you. know if that's true. I, it was something where he swindled some guy out of like ten to $15,000. Damn. And so now he's in trouble, big time. So he's running. And so he runs to his mom and his uncle, and he's trying to get money from his mom and his brother and his uncle and everything so that he could go on the run from whatever this, if it's a lawsuit or criminal charges, I don't know what it is. Jeez. He also gets his brother's ID from his mom so that whenever he gets where he's going, he can get a driver's license and a job and stuff under his brother's name. And his family's just totally cool with all of this. They know what's happening. They're like, yeah, no, obviously you're going to run. That makes the most sense. Yes. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. Here's your brother's idea. Yeah. Like, this is ridiculous. Well, that's what I was telling you. He doesn't come from the greatest family. Yeah. No. So the plan is he's going to take off from his mom's and head to New York. But he tells his mom that he's going to drop Jody off in Baton Rouge on his way to New York. And- why wouldn't he like who takes a fucking kidnapped kid on the run with them when they're right? like, yeah. it makes sense that he would take Jody back to Baton Rouge. So his mom really thought he was doing that. Yeah. Kids are annoying. They just get in the way. So this isn't yeah. something you want to take a kid with you on. Well, no, you shouldn't want to. But instead, Jeff took Jody and they got on a bus in Orange, Texas and headed for California, which is the wrong coast from where he said he was going. So. The wrong coast and the wrong way to travel too. taking a bus that long. No, thank you. Terrible. Yeah. God. Horrible. So they landed in L.A. Well, I guess landed. They pulled in to L.A. probably about a month later. I don't know how long it would step down into yeah. L.A. <laughs> A month later. <laughs> Probably, I don't know how long it takes, but it's got to be days. It's got to be. It's got to be at least two days. I would, yeah, I would think so. From Texas to 
L.A. It's got to be. Yeah. Although they're not stopping, so who knows? Well, yeah, they're stopping. They're stopping at different bus stations in Texas, and I'm sure there's one bus station somewhere in New Mexico, maybe like Albuquerque. Time out. It's not just a straight shot. It's a bus, Grant. Yeah, I know. The bus can't just get there in a straight shot. They've got to refuel and all that. Well, yeah, and they got to pick up other people and drop other people off. Oh, this sounds awful. This sounds even worse than I thought. I want nothing to do with this. <laughs> I'm sure they stopped in at least one or two stops in New Mexico and a couple in Arizona, I'm sure. Ugh, sounds terrible. I hate this yeah. already. Jeff is the worst. Yeah. So once they land or whatever we decided we were going to say in L.A., Jeff realized that he had no money. Like his family <laughs> scraped together enough money to get him a bus ticket by himself to New York. But then he bought one for him and Jody and then they didn't go to New York. They went to California. So he has no money. He didn't think this through at all. So he looked up a fellow like karate. What, what do they call them? Karate guys? Karate coaches? What do they call them? Senseis. Okay. He looked up a. I'm not going to say that because I feel like you're messing with me and you're getting me to say something that isn't real. <laughs> it's 100% real. It's a 100% sensei. That's like the, the coach guy? And, and the studio is actually called a dojo. Okay. So he called up some fellow karate guy. Karate sensei. Karate sensei. And he explained to him that Jeff had brought a group of kids to California for a karate tournament and that their bus got stolen or broke down or something and asked him if he could borrow $600 to get back to Louisiana and then he would send him the money, which I don't know how that works, but like I don't understand how he conned that guy into that. I don't know how he conned that guy into it either. I mean, if he says, hey, I'm here with a group of kids and the guy's like, cool, there's one, like, where's the rest, you know? Well, he didn't meet him. The guy Western Union him money. Oh. Yeah, he didn't meet him in person. Sorry, I'm not giving this guy 600 bucks of anything. I'm not giving anybody yeah. 600 bucks without knowing who they are. Yeah, well, he knew who he was. He was like a fellow karate guy. Yeah, but did they know each other? Yeah, that's why um, he called him. But it's like, if you have a bus full of kids, why don't you call their parents and get them all to send you 50 bucks each yeah. to get them home? <laughs> like, they're going to want their kids home. Like, why are you calling me? Yeah, it's a good point. But either way, this guy sends him $600. And he used that money to survive with Jody in California. Now, he wasn't very smart because he didn't get like a flea bag motel. 600 bucks probably could have got you pretty far in 1984. Sure. You know, at like cheap motels. But he decided to stay at the Hilton in downtown LA for like 100 bucks a night oh, the man. very first night. Yeah, that's not the way to go. But apparently after that first night, he ended up moving them to shittier motel, you know, flea bag motels, like no name, yeah, yeah. kind of sketchy places. That 600 went to 500 real quick and he was like, ooh, I can't do this. Yeah. What did he tell Jody this whole time? Did he tell Jody that this was all cool? Yeah, he was telling Jody that, you know, he they were on the run and that Jody had to pretend to be his son now and all this shit. It was... Not great. So Jody knows exactly what's going on. It's like he was like, yeah, hey, I talked to your parents. They said we can go to, you know, go to California. No, no, no. no. Gotcha. No, Jody knew he was kidnapped. But what are you going to do? You're 10? Yeah. Like, <laughs> you got nothing. You're doing what you're told. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And pedophiles have a different way of, like, abusing their victims and coercing them and stuff. Like, they don't generally always use, like, force and intimidation. Like, one of the days that he had Jody kidnapped, they fucking went to Disneyland, well, you know? Yeah. Jeff was a cool guy. He'd take them to the movies. He let them drive. They watched movies he wasn't allowed to watch at home. Like, that's how pedophiles usually do things is like they offer something that the kid wants you know what i mean like that's it's manipulation big yeah, time totally anyways after a couple of days of this bouncing around and everything they check into the samoa motel which is at 425 west catella avenue <laughs> i'm familiar with that area i don't know exactly yeah. where that is but i'm familiar catella and harbor you know where it is i I don't think the Samoa Hotel is still there, but yeah, I know where Catel and Harbor is. It is not. It's like an America's Best Quality Inn or some shit now. Probably still a sketchy. Oh, it's still super sketch, for sure. <laughs> so they check into the sketchy motel, and by 10 days into this kidnapping, Jody was really missing his parents. And he talked Jeff into letting him call his mom to tell her that he was okay. 
you know, I, I think about this sometimes too, and Jody must have been pretty good at manipulation too, or super annoying. I don't know which, but probably like really good in being able to talk his way into getting this. Like, this isn't something I'm sure Jeff was like gung ho about. I don't know, because Jeff was close with June and Gary, too. Yeah, but he's on the run with their kid. Yeah, but maybe in some weird way, he's like, maybe they should know that he's alive. You know, like, All right. they're yeah, probably I worried you're sick. Saying. I got gotcha. you. You know what I mean? Yeah. But Jeff is super stupid and super <laughs> broke, so he tells Jody to call his mom Collect. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. For any of you young kids who are listening who don't know what that is, that's where you used to like call the operator and then like they would call the person and charge that person instead of you having to pay for the call. And it was like per minute too, right? It wasn't just like, yeah. oh, well, you know, here's a dollar for our conversation. It was like, you know, it's like a no. dollar a minute. Yeah. So Jody, <laughs> Jody calls his mom collect from the motel room and told his mom they were in New York because that's what Jeff was telling him to tell her. But the mom is listening on the other end with the FBI because by this time she's called the cops nine days ago. You know, her kid's been gone for 10 days. And so the cops have been involved from day two when he didn't come back home. So the FBI and the mom are not dumb. And even though Jody says they're in New York and all this stuff, he gave them West Coast time, not East Coast time when they asked him what time it was and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, probably stuff that even Jeff probably overlooked. Yeah, just totally random. Didn't even think about it. Right, totally. After she was done talking to Jody, because like I said, this is 1984 and it was a collect call, the operator came on and I guess, I don't even remember this because collect calls were kind of really before our time too. Well, do you remember how but we I did guess... collect calls? We would call collect and give the entire message and hang up. Like, As your name. Yep. Yeah. You'd be like, mom, I'm ready at the movies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pick me up at nine. Thanks. Bye. And collect yeah. call from, hey, mom, I'm at the movies. Call me. <laughs> Pick me up at nine. Thanks. Bye. Would you like yeah, to I accept? That. Nope. <laughs> but see, I was never on the other end of a collect call. Like nobody ever called me collect. Well, we were too kid. young. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember that happening. <laughs> Yeah, but apparently after you're done with the call, the operator comes back on and you can ask for time and charges, which means like the operator will tell you how long the call was and how much it's going to cost based on where it came from and all that stuff. And so when the operator came back on and they asked for time and charges and all that stuff, the FBI came on and was like, hey, can you tell us where that call came from? And the operator was like, yeah, room 38 at the Samoa Motel in Anaheim, California. Wow. And the FBI was like, Yahtzee, this motherfucker just called collect from his motel room. What an idiot. Yeah, this guy's so dumb. Yeah, he's super dumb. Well, he's 24. (laughs) Okay, fair. Yeah. I remember being very dumb at 24, but not causing this kind of ruckus either, though. Well, no, because you weren't evil and dumb. You were just dumb. (laughs) Just dumb. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we were all dumb and 24 at some point, but most of us weren't pedophiles. Right. So, obviously, within minutes, the SWAT team is swarming room 38 of the Samoa Motel. (laughs) Yeah. They bust in guns blazing, pointed at Jeff, pointed at Jody. They did pull Jody out of the room right away, but he was shaken because they were pointing guns at him, too. I'm sure that is a very scary situation to be in. Yeah. So, and he says that before they pulled him out of the room, he heard an officer tell Jeff, I had to punch you right in the mouth. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he he ought to do that. That is correct. Yeah. But unfortunately, he didn't. They just arrested him. And this is the 29th of February, 1984, by the time they arrest him, because it was a leap year. So it was a leap year and no mouth punches. Yeah, no mouth punches. Just handcuffs. Which is kind of like, this is 84, aren't you still allowed to beat people up when you arrest them? I, I was like... kind of thinking that, actually. I was like, isn't it still cool yeah. to like beat people up and like nobody knows about it? You know? Yeah. But... Well, especially I pedophiles. Thought. I feel like that's still okay now. No, it is. For sure. 100%. Yeah. Like, I'm not about brutality by any means, but like, I'm okay with that. If someone's anyway. going to deserve it, that's, that's who deserves it. Yeah. So, they take Jody to the hospital and they interrogate him. Just like we talked about with Steven Stainer, they didn't treat child sex assault victims very well back. Like, they didn't know. Yeah. You know? So they just kind of start interrogating him like he did something wrong, you know? And they do this, like, invasive rape kit, and they're asking him, like, hey, did Jeff touch you? You know? And he's like, of course, he denied it. 
Because he's like, I don't fucking know you and you guys are all being mean to Like, no, he didn't touch me. Get away from me. Like, he didn't disclose to them because he didn't feel safe, obviously. Well, yeah, he's in a strange place with nobody he knows. God, he was probably so scared. Yeah, and they're violating him again right away, doing this rape kit and all that stuff, you know. Yeah, he just wants it to end. Yeah, and, and I've seen interviews with him, and he says that he made a conscious decision to deny the abuse allegations because he didn't really think that Jeff was going to go to prison forever. Yeah. He thought he would go back to Louisiana, fight these charges, and then he would get released. And then he doesn't know what he would have done, but he feels like he would have came after him for telling on him. So he's like, I denied it because I knew they were doing this rape kit and I knew that was going to come back positive. So I was going to let the rape kit tell on Jeff, not me. So that I could be like, hey, dude, I covered for you. Right. It makes sense when you explain it like that, but it's like crazy to think that a 10 year old had to think like that. Yeah. Went through that thought process. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, it shows the amount of abuse that had happened and, and manipulation again. I mean, yeah, because he still likes Jeff. Jeff's his buddy, you know, even with all of this stuff going on. Mm hmm. Yeah. So after a while of this and these invasive procedures, and finally he's on his way back home to Louisiana. So on March 1st, he walks off the plane, and there are his parents, and he's very excited to see them. But also, next to his parents are a bunch of news cameras that are there to film his homecoming with his parents. Which, just like the Steven Stainer thing, like, this is incredibly invasive. <laughs> right. This isn't how you do it. No. And this would never happen now. Like, they withhold the names of victims now and stuff, you know. Totally. This kid's face was all over the news as he was getting off the airplane. Celebrity for the wrong reasons. Yeah. So when he's pressed about what Jeff did while he had him kidnapped, like I said, Jody kept denying all the sexual abuse, everything. He was just like, no, we just went to Disneyland. We took like a 12-day bus ride to California and then we went to Disneyland. <laughs> So everybody's kind of happy he's home and just like Steven Stainer, they didn't think he had been sexually abused. So everybody's like, great, he's home. Everything's fine. Back to normal. Then about 10 days after he got home, the rape kit came back positive for semen on the rectal slide. Oof. So there was Oof. no more denying it. Just yep. like Steven Stainer, it was just out there. So he admitted it to his mom and told her everything that was done to him and everything that had happened and that it, and that it had been happening for about a year before he was kidnapped. Oh, man. Which was a total shock. And I'm sure it sent both parents just off the deep end. Yeah. Well, June stayed really calm when Jody told her, and he's said a lot in interviews as an adult that that made him feel very safe. So he told her everything, and she's been like his biggest support system. But he made her promise not to tell his dad, Gary, because he knew he was going to fucking kill Jeff. And so June said, okay, I promise. But she must have had her fingers crossed behind <laughs> her back or something, because she fucking told Gary anyway, she, yeah. obviously. I mean, she's got it's his dad. Gary. Yeah. Yeah. So Jody felt relief when he told his mom, like, what had happened. But June and Gary felt angry, you know, like they oh, had been yeah. violated as a family. They had been. Mm -hmm. You know, the, they offered this guy literally clothes from their own wardrobe to have to come stay with them, eat their food, it, meet their entire family. And then to be betrayed like this, like, yeah, yeah, I feel like feeling anger is uh, is correct. Totally <laughs> justified. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, so the next week was pretty bad for them. They had to try and figure out how to be there for their kid, Jody, and also how to deal with their feelings at the same time because it's hard to be, like, super livid and angry but also, like, calm and supportive. Like, that's hard. Totally. You know? Yeah. But like I said, Jody said his mom has always been his biggest support system and helped him get through this whole thing, but Gary struggled a lot. And that makes sense. I mean, you said in the beginning that – he had struggled with his drinking and that's partially why mm -hmm. they were separated anyway. So I'm sure mm -hmm. this didn't help with his drinking. No, it didn't. And the guilt, you know, from not protecting his son and oh, then the yeah. guilt of allowing this guy in and inviting him into the home. Oh man. Mm -hmm. It's just probably just weighing on him. Oh, so on March 16th, 1984, Gary was at a local bar where a lot of the friends that he had from the news station hung out because it was like right down the road from the newsroom. Right. And he mentioned to one of the people that was there that worked at the news station that the police wouldn't tell him when they were bringing Jeff back from California for obvious reasons. The police didn't want drama. 
They didn't want Gary confronting him or anything like that. So his friend from the news station decided to call over to the newsroom and find out when they were bringing him home, you know, back to Louisiana, when they were bringing him to face charges. And turns out it was at 9.08 that night. Whew. So he went back up to the bar and he's like, hey, Gary, your boy's coming home at 9.08 tonight. <laughs> you know, he was just like, told him. And I imagine Gary, like, finishing his drink real quick and be like, well, got to go. <laughs> all right. Well, like, see you guys later. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Unrelated to what you just told me, but <laughs> all of a sudden I have to go. We or something came up. Yeah. So the news crews were in the Baton Rouge airport at 9 p.m. waiting for the sheriffs to bring Jeff off the plane. And they were set up right outside the gates, like across from the bank of payphones. And this is pre-9-11, so they were like in the airport. Yeah. <laughs> Just waiting for them to bring Jeff off this plane. And in the news footage, you could see that they come around the corner and Jeff is in handcuffs and he's flanked by two sheriff's deputies. As they walk him by the news crews, the news crews are like zooming in right on his face as they walk by. And right at that moment... <laughs> A man in what you could only le call a legit disguise. He was literally wearing sunglasses, a hat, a beard, the whole nine. Yeah. Turned around from the payphones, pointed a thirty eight snub nose revolver at Jeff's head, and pulled the trigger. And Jeff goes down like a ton of bricks, too. Like, I've, yeah, I'm sure the majority of us have seen this and not maybe didn't realize the names and stuff. If you haven't seen it, it is, I don't know, what word would you use? It's startling. It's startling. Yeah. Like, it, because, you, you're watching it and you're like, okay, what's happening? And all of a sudden you see Jeff go down because you're not paying attention to that bank of phones. You watch it again after you realize what had happened. You just see Jeff walk in and as he walks past that bank of phones, Gary turns around, lifts his hand up and just fires a single shot and Jeff just hits the floor and, and the cops rush Gary super quick and... They all know him, too, which is the crazy part. Yeah. It's a small place, small little town. And they're like, what did you do that for, Gary? No, no, no. What did you do that for? Like, Well, they specifically, they yelled, why, Gary? Gary, yeah, why? That's what it was, right. Which is pretty famous line, which Jody would go on later as an adult to write a very good book. And he titled it, Why, Gary, Why? But the cops, like you said, they rush Gary at the at the payphones and they're like, Gary, why the fuck would you do this, yeah. you idiot? You know, and Jeff, meanwhile, is laying on the floor and blood is just fire hosing out of his right ear. Just the pool of blood around his body is just getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. And it's, I hate to laugh, but I have like no I don't give a fuck. It's, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> it's point so. blank range. Like. Oh, yeah. You know, it doesn't get a whole lot closer. Which is quite amazing, actually. Like, the news crews were right on the other side of him. He had two cops on either side, and Gary got him and only him. Oh, it's a straight shot. Like, if you watch the video, it yeah. is just, it lines up perfectly. It couldn't have been better. I know. So, Gary's arrested, and Jeff dies, obviously. But he doesn't die until the next day. Just a fun fact. Yeah, but he was dead laying on the airport floor. Oh, like, even the sure. cop, if you've seen the extended video, even the cop that's leaning over him, taking his pulse, closes his eyes. Oh. Because his eyes are wide open laying on the floor. And so he reaches down and closes his eyes. Like, I think even that cop thought he was dead. Yeah, I think so, too. Almost right off the bat, though, the locals sided with Gary. That doesn't surprise me in the least bit. No. They paid his $100,000 bond and... It's been said that they even helped, like, the family and stuff while he was going through his court stuff and everything. Like, the local, they, the, like, term is they say the locals acquitted him right away. They were just like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I have it. no doubt about that. Yeah. So, by the time he went to trial, pretty much the whole country had heard about this because he shot a guy on the news, so. Well, I think this story was already big enough anyway. I think everybody kind of knew about this story and Jody and... You know, being missing and all that kind of stuff. And then yeah, this found and, in California and it was live, you know, like this happened yeah. in real time. Yeah, it was great. But like I said, by the time Gary went to trial, they decided to charge him with manslaughter and he pled no contest to manslaughter. And so the judge gave him a seven year sentence, but suspended <laughs> five years probation and 300 hours of community service. So he did no jail time. Not a single day. Nope, not a day in jail. He just had to cut the grass at the church for like a couple <laughs> years, and then he was fine. 
which is fantastic. I yeah, love it. I'm I like, know. this is great. Like I said, Jody adjusted super well to getting back to normal. He had been through a horrific ordeal, not just with the kidnapping, but for the entire year before that he was being molested and assaulted, but also after with his dad's trial and everything, because he wasn't very happy that his dad killed Jeff. You know, Jeff was his friend. Like, even though he was his abuser and he hated what he was doing to him and all that stuff, he didn't want Jeff dead. I get that. I mean, I do. I understand at that age, that psyche and stuff, like, yeah, I, I, I understand it. I, I don't know that I agree with it, <laughs> but I understand. He it. also didn't want his dad to go to prison for the rest of his life yeah. for killing Jeff over this whole thing. And he has said, he's like, I knew my dad was going to kill him. If you ever found like I knew he's like, that's why I never said a word. He's like, cause I knew my dad would kill him. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> so like I said, Jody adjusted super well. He, you know, he said he got support from family and friends and their community and he's, he works in like violence prevention now and he does speaking engagements and he educates parents and survivors on recognizing abuse and lowering the risks of being victimized and all that kind of stuff. He wrote an amazing book that he recently just published. It took him like 20 something years, 30 years to write this book. He started it back in the 90s and the book's called Why Gary Why, which is what the cop yelled at Gary. Yeah. And Gary actually, I don't think we mentioned it when we were talking about that, but he looks up at the cop and he's like, if he did that to your family, you'd kill him too. Which is fair. I mean. He's like, and he even said, he goes, you don't know. You don't know what you would do. And it's like, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I don't know. And I hope to never know. No, but Jody Jody even says, like, I read his but his book is amazing. It's partially, like, educational and then it's partially entertaining and then it's partially, like, just his life story and helping survivors figure shit out and you know not feel alone it's really an amazing book actually well, he, he's one of the survivors who ends up doing some really good things and we see that in some survivors we also see survivors go the opposite way which right. is totally understandable but mm -hmm. it's so nice to hear that they're like it doesn't ruin everybody and jody is one of the people that it didn't ruin and he has made the best out of a really bad situation yeah and he's got a great sense of humor like you listen to him in interviews and he cracks jokes and he's like hey we got to talk about this shit even though it's uncomfortable because that's why it keeps happening because nobody talks about it and nobody knows what's up you know yeah. and one of the funniest things that i heard him say was 38 was jeff's unlucky number <laughs> and i was like thinking about it and i was like because he got shot with a 38 and, then, and I was like, well, that's obvious, you know, but they were in room 38 at the motel and uh, Gary was 38 years old when he shot him. I was wondering how old Gary was. I didn't put the 38 from the room together, but I was thinking, I yeah. was like, I wonder if Gary was 38 years old. So yeah. very cool. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So anyway, Jody, at some point after the shooting and stuff, forgave, not forgave, but kind of was like, hey, you know, with his dad was like, I get why you did it. Like, because it caused problems between them for a hot second. I can see that. And because a lot of people are like, oh, your dad did this for you. He's like, he's the fuck he did. He didn't do it for me. He didn't ask me to, if I wanted him to kill Jeff. He just did it. Yeah, he did it for him. Yeah. I feel like he just emotionally did it. Like, I don't think he was in his right mind. I don't think he thought it through. Because from everything I've read and heard he said, like, he went there to die that night. Like, he didn't think that he was going to live through. He thought he was going to shoot Jeff and then the cops were going to shoot him. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which, thank God they didn't, but. No, but that is, oh, man. It's one thing yeah. to, to, you know, think, okay, I this guy's not getting out of this. But to think, I'm going in this and I'm not getting out. I mean, that's. A whole other mindset. Yeah. Crime of passion. Although I will say I watched an interview with him from ESPN from like just a couple years before he passed away, which was in 2014. And he was in poor health. He had had a stroke and he was having a hard time talking. But they asked him, do you regret shooting Jeff? And he said, no. Uh -uh. I think he said hell no, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he did. I think he did say hell no. <laughs> and then they said, would you do if you could go back, would you do it again? And he said, of course I would. Or like something like, absolutely I would or something. Yeah. And yeah, there's no remorse. He does not feel remorse at all. And, you know. None. I can understand it. Oh, totally. I'm fine with it. I know. The politically correct thing to say is, hey, we don't condone violence and, you know, all that stuff. But I'm totally fine with this. I have no problem with it. I think overall I'm fine with it, too. <laughs> I don't want this to become a thing where everyone's just running around killing each other. Although... <laughs> a little bit where we're at anyway now but <laughs> yeah. you know but as for what happened yeah 
I'm not too upset about it. I'm not like, oh man, he needed to be tried. Like he did what he had to do to protect his family and his little boy. So, you know. Yeah, and I'm okay with it. I think that's what everyone saw. They saw a situation where it was like, hey, we've never been in there, but I would hate that too. Yeah, so anyway, that's the crazy story of Gary Plache and his son Jody and this fucking douchebag Jeff Doucette. Yeah, I'm glad we did this one. This one's really an iconic episode. And, you know, again, maybe the names don't stand out, but most people listening to this have probably seen the video and your jaw drops. Oh, yeah. Your jaw absolutely drops. And if you haven't seen the video... You're probably the only person in the world because that video has been viewed like some astronomical amount of millions of times on YouTube. I know. Like, I've just seen since it. YouTube's been around, like how many people saw it when it actually happened? Probably another millions and millions yeah. and millions, you know? Yeah. So anyway, if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube. Check it out. And it's not gory either. Like. It's walking by, you kind of get an idea. Remember, this is 1984 technology, so... Yeah, it's not very good video anyway. Right, exactly. You get the idea, but you don't get grossed out. One of my favorite things that Jody said in an interview that I heard him, he was talking about how everybody around there loved his dad, even before this happened. Like, he was a well-known guy. And he was like, oh yeah, everybody loves my dad. He could get away with murder. Oh, <laughs> Wow. Man, Jody's just got him. He's just he's just. But going you know how people right. say that. Yeah. Like, but you know how people say that all the time. Like, oh, he can get away with a murder. Oh yeah, Jody's and, sharp. He's he's yeah. not letting this get him down. Oh no, he's pretty funny. So if you guys are interested in hearing more about this story in much better detail by a much better storyteller than us, you guys should go to Amazon and buy Jody's book. It's called Why Gary Why. And when you buy it. If you've changed your Amazon smile to DNA to Dough Project, you're doing twice the good. Yeah. You're always stealing my line, man. I'm trying to help. But it comes in paperback or Kindle version. And it's like 10 bucks. It's really, it's a really good read. And it's an easy read. It's not super long. It's, it's an easy book. All right. Well, this was a good one. Happy Father's Day, bud. Thank you. I appreciate it. Go to our Instagram at From Crime to Crime. Let's talk about this. We're going to have this up on there. We want to hear what you have to say. You know, leave your comments, leave your thoughts. Is this okay? Does anybody disagree with it? Let us know. At From Crime to Crime. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there and all the moms that have to be dads. Yep. Love you guys. All right. I love you. I'll talk to you later. Love you too. Bye. Bye. Bye.